Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Engage, Innovate, and Inspire CPD session on Tuesday, the 24th of September 2013. Um, I'm recording this session today, so if you miss it, you can catch it up on YouTube. That's www.youtube.com forward slash digital ipacker. Um, the focus on my session today is all about good to outstanding tools, and it's great to see so many people here. Thank you for turning up. Um, so, for today's session, I've based um, all of my materials on an iPacker lesson observation sheet. You may or may not be familiar with this. These are the sheets that get filled out when um, someone's being observed teach. And I focused on two areas in particular, um, and those are teaching. Those are teaching itself and assessment. There are other areas of the form, but I've just chosen to focus on those two points. Um, I hope to share lots of things with you today. Um, and maybe one or two of them will be useful to take away and use in your teaching and learning. So as I said, this is about good to outstanding tools, those things that can just tip you over the edge maybe. And to start, I just wanted to pull out one word that has been evidence, evidenced a lot in the reading that I've been doing um, about outstanding teaching and learning, and that is the word variety. Um, it appears that, that variety is the key to outstanding teaching and learning making things fresh keeping it new making change in your classroom all the time it's certainly something that I felt teaching younger children it was a complete essential thing to do to move the classroom around to make things look different to teach in a different way to use a different voice um, to just try and experiment my, as a professional all the time to deliver outstanding learning so here's some quotes, um, the first one of which is from uh, Mr. Go's best friend, Sir Michael Wilshire, uh, who's head of Ofsted. And back in May 2003, he said that Ofsted should be wary of trying to prescribe a particular style of teaching. This is where this word variety pops out at you, because it's not about one rule fits everyone. It's about doing what's best for your class at that moment in time. And if that's taking them outside, going for a walk, looking at this, looking at that, if that's turning around... Um, the learning so that they lead that experience, then if that's best, then do that for your pupils. There was another quote um, from Ofsted that said, you know, if Ofsted came and saw a lesson where children were reading, as long as it was in, just reading, as long as it was in context, then that would make sense. So another quote, um, this time from the Second Ed magazine, is that what is an outstanding lesson? The question was asked in, um, in the magazine, what is an outstanding lesson? And the response was is that there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing that makes a lesson outstanding. And um, Ofsted in the report, again, said there are many routes to excellence. There is not just one way. And certainly I'm not suggesting that the resources that I'm showing tonight are the one way to excellence. And the resources I use, I'm going to show you tonight, if not using the correct context and to support learning, could, you know, could easily um, lead to worse outcomes in your class. So it's about using what's right for your pupils. And finally, um, there's a quote, another quote here from Sir Michael Walshaw, um, and this is what the real focus is. This is what Ofsted are looking at. And when pushed at the London Festival of Education for what Ofsted inspectors were looking for, Sir Michael Walshaw responded that inspectors should simply judge teaching on whether children are engaged, focused, learning, and making progress. And that, after all, isn't that what it's all about? That's what our teaching is judged on, those key areas of engagement, focus, learning and progress. And I hope that some of the resources I share with you tonight do that. And there's a nice word he adds at the end, it's a word that I use a lot, and it says that in the best lessons, the pupils are being inspired. And I hope that um, I will do that in my teaching tonight and share some inspiring things with you. So, teaching. Um, the biggest focus of the things I want to share with you tonight, really, I want to pick out some of the points that are made, and the first one of which is that we need good pedagogy, it goes without saying, and there's a real key here in terms of ensuring quality planning, making sure success criteria and learning objective are clear. And at the top of the sheet here, I've just put how can learning on objective, how can learning objectives and success criteria be shared effectively? Can technology be helped? Can, can technology help do this? Um, can they, can they enrich the experience? Um, because too often um, learning objects and success criteria are just put on the board and maybe not referenced. Is that the best way to share them? Um, could we not share them via text message in advance of the lesson um, to send it to our parents' learners to say, you know, your child's going to be learning something really exciting tomorrow. Here's what they need to be thinking about. You know, wetting their appetite, doing it in a different way. Sending an email to the students um, saying, check out this YouTube clip. It's going to help us with what we're learning tomorrow. Just getting them to 
you know, think differently. Obviously, a blog is a really useful tool, and I'll focus on that in a second. And obviously, you know, having some form of class website where constant information goes up, or Edmodo, or something along those lines. So let's have a little look at blogs. Let's create a blog using Blogger in five minutes or less. Now, if you have a Gmail account, you can come right up and sign in. If not, you click create a blog, you'll be walked through a very simple form and you'll be up and running in a minute. Uh, I have a Gmail account, so I'm going to go ahead and sign in. And as you can see, I already have a couple of blogs, but we're going to go ahead and click create a blog. And I'll show you how easy this is. Let's say I've, for my classroom, I want to have Mr. Barnes' Virtual Language Arts as my title. And you can change your title anytime. Uh, here's where you might have to be a bit creative because there's a lot of people on Blogger Barnes class blog one two three four I'm gonna go ahead and check availability and that's available which is good I gotta click in this word verification and hopefully that's right if not it'll give me another one and as I click continue um, it works and as you see I get this choose a template and this is really nice because blogger gives you a chance to make your blog uh, look different from other people so you can select a lot of different templates and you can change your template whenever you want so I'm gonna go ahead and click this black one here and continue and look at that my blog has been created and I'm ready to start blogging all I have to do is click there and I come into what looks like a word document and I'm ready to go so I put in my first post. I want my students, my parents to see this. Uh, I might say check out our blog weekly for updates. Maybe I want that to be a little bigger and I just highlight it and I come over here to my text and I go to large. Maybe I want a different font. I click the little F there and I decide to go to this one and you know what? I don't like black. If it's a little simple I come down here and I click blue um, I, I've highlighted that and I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna go with a yellow there's all kinds of things I can do maybe I want a picture I click there and I've got one on my desktop I can browse for it I can click a URL if I want I can get it from there I'm ready to go I'm gonna go ahead and click publish post and I'm gonna click view blog and there it is I have a blog already and I've got some things over here uh, my students can come on my parents can come on and they can see it but you know what I'd like to add to it I'd like to make it a little bit nicer I can put some different things over here so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click add a gadget and look at all these things that come up you can add static pages you can get people to follow you and that means they would be reading your blog regularly you can click text and the nice thing with the text is you can put in some HTML code and add pictures and uh, interactive things like maybe a, a Vokey podcast, uh, a video bar. I mean, there's just tons of things you can do. All I got to do is click add. Maybe I want to put a poll. Do you like it? And I can say yes, and I can say no, and I can click save, and there it is. And then I can click view blog and uh, take a look at it and there's my poll and uh, I got a lot of things going on here so that is blogger and as you can see it's very simple get started your students are um, the other thing is that we can use Google Forms um, as a great way of engaging learning and checking prior knowledge um, Google Forms are really quick and easy to make if you use Google Docs at all all you need to do is press create and instead of create a document you create a form and you could have this form used for every lesson you, once you create one form it could be the first thing that students do when they come into your classroom they, ex they, they could just say what their expectations of the lesson are or what they've done for homework or what um, what they're hoping to get out of the lesson ahead or what they learned last lesson there's lots of opportunities and Google Forms are very quick and easy to do Good morning. I wanted to give a brief overview about how Google Forms can be useful in our classrooms and how to quickly make one and put it out there for student use. Now, in grade 12 and grade 11 English, for example, 
we've been using these forms for both IELTS writing and IELTS reading. Uh, we can use them to collect qualitative answers and quantitative answers. So, for example, writing a qualitative answer, we would have a task on the blog, and then we would have a link to where the students post their answer. So in this case, it would be a very quick and easy submission form. Students write their name, section ID, put in their essay, and that essay will then get input into a spreadsheet, which I can very quickly assign a grade or level two, you know, based on what I see. And this is great for feedback, quick feedback to the students. Next, for quantitative answers, where you have a number of questions with defined answers that are either right or wrong, you can again put a task up. Here, for example, I have a whole lesson on IELTS reading where I have activities and videos, and I have an online quiz that I prepared for the students, which is another Google form. In this case, we have a text and then a set of IELTS style questions and then a place for answers to go in. The results go into a spreadsheet that is marked using conditional formatting. So it automatically highlights the right and wrong answers, allowing me to very quickly assign a grade to the students, giving them instant feedback right there, right after they have completed it. Now, how do we make one of these and how do we put it up for use? First thing we do is we go to Google Docs and we go create new form. This will bring up a form. We can give it a title. So whatever, whatever the title is. And in this area here where it says post instructions, you can actually put a lot of stuff. You can put an entire text in there. Even an example from the reading here, you could take an entire an entire prepared text, for example, and you can just quickly paste it in there. And then put questions. So this is super for reading because you can have an entire reading text there, and then you can have a, a series of set questions. Then all you have to do is create your questions, however many questions you want, and the answers will be dumped directly into a spreadsheet linked with this form. When the form is done, okay, and you click Save, at the very bottom of the screen it says you can view the published form here. All you have to do, click the link, so it opens the form, you take that link, and then when you go to the blog you make your new post and you simply put the link there. So fairly quick and simple to create something that can just be embedded, put in something else. You don't even need to put it into a blog, you can just email the student and say, you know, I want you to fill out this form today, and you can instantly make that. And the great way of doing that, opposed to having things in separate places, is that when it all comes back, it stays in one document. It's not lots of documents flying around everywhere. The other tool that's fantastic to use um, in this way is Socrative. Socrative um, was used a lot last year by people that were using the iPads in classrooms. Um, but Socrative doesn't just work on iPads, it works on all sorts of devices. This is the one back in September that I tried to demo and it didn't work in front of everyone. <laughs> um, but since then I've heard people have been using it effectively. Um, here's a little overview of Socrative. James here and today we're going to be talking about Socrative and how I use it in the classroom. Socrative is a web-based application that allows teachers to quickly and effectively facilitate discussions and assess student learning. After creating an account, each teacher is assigned a room number. Once students enter the room, teachers are given a variety of tools that they can use to interact with their students. They can easily ask their students multiple choice questions, true false, short answer, or even start a quiz or an exit ticket. For example, if a teacher wants to ask his or her students a multiple choice question, they click the multiple choice button and on the student's students can answer whatever question is asked. I like it because it only gives the students the answer options. It is really easy to display the questions on the projector, ask them out loud, or write them on the board, and I don't have to fuss with typing in all the answer options every time I want to ask a question. It is also really easy to create and assign quizzes and exit tickets. 
Here I have a variety of exit tickets I have pre-created and I can assign them whenever I need to with a few simple clicks. Let me show you how easy it is to create a quiz. The first thing you do is select Manage Quizzes, then click Create Quiz. Then I can choose whether I want to add a multiple choice question or open any questions. It is really easy to type your questions, type in the answers, select the correct answer, and then move on. Once your quiz has been created, you'll have access to it from the menu of previously created quizzes. And at any time, you can go back in, select the quiz, and have a report sent to your email based on the student's results for that quiz. Probably one of the coolest features is you can take any of these quizzes that you've created and turn it into an interactive classroom game, which is called a space race. To start a space race in your class, select the quiz that you want to have turned into a game, select the number of teams you want to have, and you can choose whether or not you want to auto-assign the teams, click next, and the game is off and running. Let me show you how it works in my class. And the other team's off in the lead, followed by green, the red's on the board, followed by pink. All the red team is now caught up the green, yellow and red are in a three-way tie. Yellow is still on the lead, followed by green, then pink. Then blue is the red and purple, then black. Yellow is still on the lead, followed by green, then pink. Oh, and the purple is pulling up. There's four-way green with blue and pink, not too far behind. Red is, the purple is in the lead by a little bit, and... Red is a winner. <laughs> and that is Socrative. If you would like to use Socrative in your classroom, simply go to t.socrative.com and sign up for an account. And it's really quick and powerful. I'm wondering. Hi. Once you've made then it's then it's there. It's there to use again and again and again. And you can actually share quizzes with other people if you're in a department, for example you can actually share the code, so they give you a unique code um, of your quiz, and if you actually physically tell somebody that code, they can import the codes, so it's a nice way of sharing resources with different people, and like I said, it works on any device, so it will work on Chrome, but it will also work on iPads and mobile phones, and different things along those lines, and there's no limit to the number of people you can have in a room, either. so if you want to run a quiz between the number of people, you can, it's not an issue. The other thing that, that's there as well is Edmodo, um, talked a bit about Emodo a few times, but a really powerful tool for setting homework and just encouraging, um, like I've kind of put there for that link there, that pupil participation because it gives them the opportunity to participate both at home and at school and you get a real flow through. Um, I also put later on when we talk about assessment, um, the, the guidance on how to progress and then it says homework set and done. And Edmodo provides a fantastic... Um, record to show which homework was set and which was done. Because I know I went and observed the lesson um, in secondary last term and I went round and spoke with the pupils, looked in their planners and so many of them didn't have their homework written in their diaries um, for whatever reason. And when I spoke to the support in that, that room, she said, you know, the teacher does set it every week um, but they just don't write it down or they get half of it written down because it's the end of the lesson and they run off and whatever it may be. Whereas as Edmodo, You've only got to write it down once, which you probably have to do on your planning anyway, or record it somewhere. But because you're recording it at Edmodo, it goes once, and it automatically goes into all of their homework diaries on Edmodo. And it's just a quick and easy way to do it. And hopefully, ah, that video is not going to show. Let's see if I can click out and... Um, let's see if we can go to this one now.
Okay, so I think the really important thing there is, and one thing that I particularly like about Edmodo is that there's no admin in terms of setting up classes. Because you, all you need to do is press create a group, give that a name, so it could be year six um, geology group. And then you have a unique code, and then the responsibility is then on the child, the people, to set up their account. Because all you need to do is give them that code, and say, you know, our group code is XY743. They write that in their planners, they write it in their phone, whatever. They go away, they all sign up to the group. When you feel happy that all students have signed up to the group, you can lock that code which will mean that nobody outside can get into that group. Um, you can open that code up at any time, you can change that code at any time. So if you've, if you've got a reason to believe that the students in there that shouldn't be in there, you can reset the code and issue the code again to students. It's a, it's a lot easier than any traditional virtual learning environment where there's a lot of admin control and people have got to be put into groups and all that sort of thing because the, the emphasis is on the child. Um, with all those Modo accounts that I pack, we don't know the students' passwords, they're responsible if they lose them they need to come to you again and ask for the group code and sign up again because we can't reset them. You can also invite parents to be members of a group as well, which can be quite useful. Um, and you can also invite other teachers and support staff and different things like that. Um, the next thing really um, on the sheet was looking at um, mutual support and encouragement um, and enabling all learners to make progress and within Google Docs the comments feature is really good and it allows children to comment on different things both in Edmodo you can do that you can put up a discussion point and they can talk and obviously in Google Docs now I know you, Sarah you've had a problem with the comments in the sense that they can press resolve can't they yes. um, which is something we might just need to explore and develop but if we're just doing it between two in a peer kind of setup it can be quite useful so if a child's done their essay on something, they can share it with just one other child and give them the comment feature, and they can go through and peer review their work. And comments um, work. I'm going to show you in two minutes now how to use others. comments to mark work in Google Docs. I'm coming particularly from a primary point of view, but I'm sure you could use this across the age ranges. Let's say we've got a piece of work here that I'm reading, and um, I've noticed this word exciting here. I think this child could really be pushing themselves to use some more interesting vocabulary than that. So I can just click on insert, click on comment, and the bubble comes up at the side, linked with my username, so they know it's from me, and I can write a comment to them saying, uh, could you use a more interesting word? Click on comment, and that's now saved there on the document. They can, they can see that. Um, they can also write replies to it. If they're just reading through and they see this highlight here, you can click on it and up pops the particular comment that's linked to that word. Also, if you see the comments down the side, you can click on that and that links to the highlight here. Now, what's really powerful about that is that you can actually do it whilst children are working. We've got two children here who are actually working. You can see typing away and I can go onto their work and I can insert comments to give them some ideas for things to do whilst they're actually doing a piece of writing. To make this even more powerful, you can have children going on to each other's pieces of work. So if we have a look here, if we click on this comment, there's something, some uh, positive feedback that I put in. And um, another child has put in some positive feedback here. I've uh, put in some, some feedback myself, and we've got a child um, answering and having a little bit of a conversation about that. And here we've got two children having a conversation around different parts of the document. The great thing about this one is, at the end, the uh, author decides to credit his editors for the help that they've given him. Really simple but really powerful way of extending children's writing. And that's really quick and simple and easy to do. It's just, it's just managing that process of who's going to comment on whose. And you don't have to be involved in setting that up. You can just say, okay, you over this side of the room, you're going to comment on this person's work. So, um, the other thing that it comes to, it talks about is um, that the learning dis environments and displays. And one idea that a few people have picked up on in IPACA is the use of Orasma, which is a really powerful app. Augmented reality can be used in amazing ways in your classroom. You can use it to engage your learners in the content you want them to understand. Or see if they understand the concepts taught. Yeah, we got it. Right. 
So um, Orasma works by putting a augmented reality layer on top of an image. And when that's an augmented reality layer, I'm just talking about another piece of media. That could be a video or a picture. And um, what it does is when it hits the first image, it tests the database to see if you've put something in there, and then it throws out the second image on top. Um, it works really positively for, um, I know that you know, six under live in music, for example, with World War II posters. They've, had a, they've drawn their pictures of Winston Churchill, they've gone along, they've had up the iPad to it, and what they've done is they've added videos of themselves dressed up as Winston Churchill, giving a speech and sharing that information. Um, it does work better with iPads. Um, it's not something that works on the Chromebooks, but it's something nice. It's a nice kind of feature um, to bring learning alive in other ways. The other thing you can use, which is kind of the forerunner to Orasma, is QR codes. And those are the little black and white codes that you get um, and you can scan. You can scan those with a Chromebook camera, um, so you can send children off to websites in a different way. It's all about that variety again, it's not just showing a link through a website or emailing them a link and saying, you know, this link is inside a QR code, scan it with your Chromebook to see it. And to make a QR code, if you just type in QR code maker into Google, there's lots of free things that come up. And all, all you do is put the address you want to send them off to, um, and then stick it, and then just let them go with it really. And the library are exploring how they can create more interactive book reviews with QR codes. They're going to stick QR codes on the back of the books that have been reviewed so that they link together. And it's just, you know, they could put the web address in there, but nobody wants to sit there and type the web address in when you could scan it. It's just a little bit more exciting. And again, it's just about that variety, really. Um, on the sheet here, I've put a variety of activities. I'm not going to go through all of them um, because the majority of these I've already shared at other sessions. But there are so many tools out there to use to support learning. Um, if you haven't seen my video before, if you go to www.youtube.com forward slash digital ipaca, that's www.youtube.com forward slash digital ipaca, um, there's a video on there called Tools to Teach the IPC with. And it's designed for primary teachers, but there's a lot more ways a secondary could use it as well. Um, and a lot of these things that are on this mind map here I shared as part of that presentation. So just going around, a wiki is like a quick blog. It's a quick way of explaining something. And it's really nice for something like maths. You can create a wiki site with loads of errors in and then get the children to go in and change those errors. It's a nice activity because they, they, you know, whatever age you are, you like correcting the teacher. Um, and it's kind of saying, you know, I've made this, but it's wrong. You know, can you spot the errors that we've put in it? deliberately or non-deliberately, however you want to approach it with your class. You can do that with a blog or a Google Doc as well then. You know, you give a document and say there's errors in this, let's change it. Um, Wonderwall is not a piece of IT, it's just it's just a concept really of having a wall in your classroom that's dedicated to questioning. So if you've got a question about a particular use of language or a particular word that might mean something, you can put it up there and the idea is that it's collaborative and students and teachers can reply. So teachers can add questions up there as well, and it's just it's just a straightforward concept really. It could be done with post-it notes or you could use some whiteboard paint and make a whiteboard or blackboard in your classroom just so that there's this opportunity to show that we're collaborative in our learning. It's not just the teachers, it's not all one way. We've got questions as well, and can some of the students help help us with those answers? Poplet on the right there is a mind mapping tool on the internet. It's a collaborative mind mapping tool. Um, you start it off, you share the link with your students and then they can add more thoughts and develop them. Underneath it there, post-it wall again is linking back to the wonder wall really. Zoo Burst at the bottom is a, is a way of making your own digital electronic books. Um, and they're 3D so they pop out. Um, they also work with augmented reality. You can print off a code and hold it up in front of the webcam and the book pops out of your hand itself. Um, and it's nice and it's animated and it's, it's fun really. Woolwisher is a electronic pin board basically. It allows you just share the link with people and they can put whatever they want up on it. So it's nice for questions at the beginning of a lesson. 
if you want it, or a cleaning activity, what have you learned today, put it on our wall and just say, here's the address. Just everybody stick your thoughts up. Um, Skype, obviously, you know, that's not filtered in school now. If you want to call in another country and speak to people, you can now. It's, it's straightforward. Um, it's, it, we, we have, those filters have been relaxed now. Geocaching, getting them out and about using um, GPS technology to find um, different resources. Stop motion animation is really easy to do now. Um, it's best done on an iPad um, using an app called um, iMotion. However, you can do it on a Chromebook because obviously it's just putting a series of pictures together. So if you've got um, the camera fit function and get the angles right, it can be done. Radio shows are easy to make. Um, using a web website called www.spreaker.com that's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R um, and that's making live podcasts um, they just need to sign up and they can actually sign in with their IPAC or email address press record and they're away they've got a live radio booth and they can add sound effects they can bring in other microphones they can do all sorts of things like that um, Artisan Cam is a primary site but good for picture books um, and then when we think about research, we often think of Google, but you can use Google in so many different ways. You can search Google um, on a timeline search, so you can look for things that were set at a certain time. So, for example, if you type the word Wimbledon into Google, and on the left-hand side, if you go to um, timeline search, at the top it will bring up a timeline, and you can search based upon the year. So um, if you go back into the 16th century, you will see that Wimbledon used to be a small village with a pump in and then it grows and grows and grows till you get to the, obviously the, the tennis spectacular news that comes in towards towards the 20th century onwards. Um, and that's just a really good way of showing history in Google Search. Also in Google Search, which is really useful, on the left hand side there's further under advanced options, you can search by reading level. So if you're searching for about, say, um, a, let's say Florence Nightingale in history, you can avoid all kind of academic papers and focus on things that were designed for infant age children or lower reading ability. So if you've got children that struggle to read in your class, um, you can use that tool to really get content to them quickly. It might be in geography that you're looking at city and you want some really basic information. You don't want the um, Lonely Planet Guide to Paris. You just want the very basics of population and, um, and you know, favourite foods, I don't know. But um, that's really easy to do if you use a reading level because you instantly filter out the stuff that's really academic. The other tools that we've got are Britannica Online. We have a subscription for that in school. Um, and also another good one is Infant Encyclopedia. That's for our primary colleagues. And um, Eclipse.net is currently our library system. It's web-based. So if we want to search for a book, we don't have to just search for a book in the Royal Manor Library. We can look across all the iPacker libraries to see what we've got now. Um, that's still something that's developing. So those are all those things. So moving on to assessment. Um, this is where I sort of bring it to a close, really. Um, there are lots of features that IT can support with assessment. We've already talked about Edmodo and the use of homework activities, and we've talked about Google Docs for providing instant feedback within lessons and also peer peer marking. There's a, there's another tool within Google Docs um, that you can add, which is called Audio Comments, which I personally think is incredibly powerful um, because it saves teachers sitting there typing because they can just sit there, press record, and their comments, their feedback can go as an audio comment as this example shares. Hi, I'm Jen Roberts and I'm going to show you today how to use a new tool in Google Docs to add voice comments to a student's essay. To do this, you first need to have the voice comments app enabled in your Google Docs. To do that, you go to the Create button and select Connect More Apps. From Connect More Apps, you want to search for voice. Uh, voice comments is the first choice that comes up. Mine says rate it, yours will say connect like these other apps do. So mine's already connected, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. To give a student voice comments on their essay, instead of opening the essay the way you normally would, you simply right click on the essay or command click if you're using a map. Open with voice comments. Takes a moment to load. And I have my student's essay. And it's ready for me to record. As soon as it finishes loading, the record button pops up. One important thing to mention is before you finish or close this window, you want to make sure you share your recording with your collaborator so that your student will be able to see it. So let me go ahead and record a little bit of uh, information for my student, and then I can show you how this works. So I'll go ahead and click record. Hi there. I really like the start you have on your essay. 
This is Mrs. Roberts, by the way. We're doing a little test of voice comments. I see you have a holding spot here for your introduction paragraph, and that's fine. You have your uh, body paragraphs going about Tom and Daisy and Gatsby, and more about Tom and Gatsby. I'm scrolling down, by the way. Uh, it helps to tell students that you're scrolling when you're recording, because otherwise they may not see it, but you did that. Um, and I see you still have some more work to do down here at the end of your essay, and that's fine. We're going to have time to finish that up. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give the student as much detailed feedback as I like. And then when I'm done, I'll go ahead and stop recording. The red button there. Takes a moment to process. And I can play it back. I'll torture you with all that again. I wanted to add this uh, recording though to the document so that the student will be able to get your feedback. So go ahead and click Share with Collaborators. The link has been added to the Google Doc. And then, from the student's perspective, when they switch over to their actual Google Doc, and they come up here to the Comments button, and you will have to show them that they need to do this or add an actual comment to their document to tell them that they need to do this. But when you click on that, you get an option to view the voice feedback. And that is how they will access the feedback that you gave them. They also need to learn to click the green button there as well. And that's my feedback. So that's how you can go about adding voice comments to your students' essays uh, to give them a lot more feedback and a lot less time. I hope that helps you. Thanks very much for watching. So just again, another quick and fairly straightforward tool. Um, just to finish, really, um, I started with a quote from Bromley in the Secondary Ed, mag secondary ed magazine um, that said there's no silver bullet. Um, and that article went on to say, but if I were to define in, in just three short words the spark that makes some teachers outstanding, it would, always, um, it would be as follows, and that is to know your pupils. And that's obviously the most important thing about making outstanding learning. I hope that some of the tools that I've shared today will, will be useful moving forward. Um, and thank you.